please come in. You're right on time. The door only opens when the clock strikes midnight. Georgia and Hannah are preparing to broadcast from the Belvedere. Just like this old bell tower, they have many stories to tell. Some old and some new. Follow me up these stairs, but mind your step. Ah, they're waiting for you. Art. Western death practices or like death culture. Isn't it so strange? It's fucking creepy, man. It's weird. I literally can rant about this for a full episode. So let's just do it. Let's just one well. day. <laughs> but yeah, um, the concept of an open casket funeral is so creepy to me. Not because it's like a dead body lying there, it's like the efforts that Western society goes through to make a person look like they're still alive that is fucking creepy to me like put them on a pedestal for everyone to see so full, they like, can full be of like, preservatives yes remember what they looked like when they were alive three days ago in case you forgot here's this giant photo that we blew up of them i know <laughs> But also, so they, here's their dead corpse. Take, yeah, they probably a look a lot better in that photo <laughs> than they do on the table. <laughs> yeah. Um... I know. I'm a big fan of two things when it comes to death. One, burn that body. Just get rid of it. it don't let anybody else see it. Sky burial. Sky burial, yes. Anything but, like, this nonsense about just letting it sit in a wooden box a shiny wooden box yeah where everybody has to stare at this dead body and kiss its forehead and blah 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 and the second thing i'm a fan of is just letting the dead person rot in your house yes my okay slightly related but not really my favorite funerary practice i've heard of is from papua new guinea I got a lot going on over there. You build a hut, and then a, which is like part of the funerary practice is to build this hut. And then you build a, a fire in the middle and you put a scaffold over it. And then you set the body on the scaffold like it's a chair. Mm. You basically mummify them with smoke. That'll like it's it. fucking barbecue. <laughs> and then you there, there's like a procession. It takes like two weeks or something. And then there's a procession to the outside of town where like they set the scaffolds and then like they protect the village they're the ancestral spirits that protect the village and once a year you process them back into the village and like have a big party um and it's great it sounds like a great fucking time what a ripe time to be talking about death yep <laughs> it's like i've been thinking about it a lot or something that's crazy death is all around us yeah um, well you know i just read that book about well, from my Coven Book Club, talking about like rituals and things. And then so yesterday, I feel like this is going to be a tangent. That's fine. We're we're already off to a great start. I know. For context for everyone else, my grandma died yesterday. And so uh, when I came home from work, I, like I told you, I was doing all this reading for things that people put on ancestor altars. And so I, I was just sitting there thinking, am I really going to be that person that's like standing there at the gravesite? putting fucking dirt in a baggie to bring home with me (laughs) the answer is probably yes as an archaeologist i feel like the answer is already swaying a little (laughs) bit one way yeah (laughs) as a strange person it gets tipped a little further (laughs) okay i also had this is completely off topic for for that conversation but steering us more towards our fade in we we haven't already faded in (laughs) you know how (laughs) I always joke about being a vampire because I hate the sunlight and everything. You know, I only want to sit in my cave. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh my god, garlic makes my tummy hurt. (laughs) It's true. What if I manifested it with my jokes about being a vampire? (laughs) I don't know that that's it. I don't think it is either, but I'm really bummed about it. I think your gut biome is just fucked. Drinking wine (laughs) is going to help. It's fine. Is it red wine? 
no oh well. it's um divorce demeanor okay so on that note we talked about vampires a lot we sure did in the last episode so let's keep that conversation going yeah. are you ready yeah i'm ready <laughs> did you hear that sure did okay Oh, actually, um, I wanted to mention that at seven, my alarm will go off to feed Milo. I gave Luna her little bit of dry food, but um, I told her she had to wait for her wet food till it was done. Yeah, because she understands you. Compromising. <laughs> she left me the fuck alone, so. Okay. Most cultures seem to have creatures that share similarities with our concept of a vampire, even though the vampires we know is predominant predominantly european idea (laughs) that undead revenant with like the pale skin and the fangs rising from their graves at night to drink um the blood of the living and being averse to sunlight and garlic and anything holy and no reflections and getting stabbed with a wooden stake and being sparkly (laughs) bat wings so originally there were several thoughts on how one might become a vampire so i was going to start there before we go to vampire origins so being bitten obviously um some theories involve sorcery i assume like a cursed bloodline or something suicide is always i feel on the list of how to become any kind of supernatural entity Mm -hmm. probably because the church sucks it's a sin to kill yourself it's a sin to be so depressed that you don't want to be here anymore it's it's a (laughs) cop-out become a vampire (laughs) You want to die? Get ready to live forever. Maybe that's what it is. It's like, oh, it's a punishment. It's a punishment in itself. If you kill yourself, you are going to be punished by having to live forever, you dumb fuck. Mm -hmm. But mostly it's babies. There's a lot of baby things going on. So, like, babies being born with teeth. Disgusting. Yeah, I know. Absolutely not. Has that actually ever happened? That's like, I think. Babies born with teeth. Uh, Yeah, I've seen. That's disgusting. I've seen pictures of babies and teeth and babies in full heads of hair and it's like i can't get with that that's whatever although i think that might have something to do with becoming a werewolf but that's a that's another topic for another day babies born on christmas (laughs) why also babies born between christmas and epiphany so unfortunately we should probably go state cat after this because um, she was born between Christmas and Epiphany. <laughs> mm-hmm. Shout out Jesus, by the way. Although she gets really tan in the summer, you know. So, mm-hmm. and she brought over a garlic bread last week. She sure did. And I, I was the only person her. who couldn't eat it. Sure were. My notes say, well, we could use crucifixes and holy water against her, or we could chop off her head and burn her body. Cat, which would you prefer? Let us know in the comments, <laughs> <laughs> bro. <laughs> Listen, man, I don't think about having to defend myself against my friends and i don't think about what if this person became a supernatural creature but now you've got me thinking if you actually were a vampire if you became a vampire and you wanted to suck my blood which first of all fucking cringe what the fuck is wrong with you oh my god especially because of what we'll talk about later just (laughs) yeah oh boy i think i can guess from what i know about vampires fuck (laughs) I don't know what I would do because I feel like you would just kill me. And I don't know. I I, I don't know what to do. In- well, we do have that murder-suicide pact, so. <laughs> You're right. Well, if, if you become a vampire and I kill myself, I'll probably become a vampire too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Please continue. Right. We're not going to kill Kat. Thank you. No, we won't. Apparently, in Romani lore, One way you can stop a vampire, this is the best thing I've ever heard, is by throwing their sock into a river. What if they're not wearing socks? They gotta be wearing socks. I do, I like that almost as much as I'm like compulsively counting the seeds or grains, Mm. I think. So those are some ways you can become a vampire. The word for vampire didn't exist in ancient times, so blood drinking and activities we associate with vampires now were typically attributed to demons or evil spirits or revenants like the Tala. Oh, yeah. Among the first civilizations to have tales of blood-drinking demons were the Persians. And evidence of this has been found depicted on pottery shards. Uh, Wikipedia said pottery shards, but we're professionals, so... I'm not saying anything. (laughs) Shard sounds too much like shark, so that's my take on that matter. so fair, actually. Okay. Babylonia and Assyria had stories 
of, I don't know if it's Lilithu or Lilithu, but basically character synonymous with the biblical Lilith, obviously from Hebrew demonology. And she was considered to be a demon and often depicted as drinking the blood from babies. Jewish folklore also includes stories of creatures called estries, demonic female shapeshifters who drink the blood and they looked for victims in the night. Fascinating. And then in Greek mythology, there's a whole bunch of different like vampire-esque entities. Empusa, I think is how you say it. I did not take Greek. Don't come at me. They are also shapeshifting females said to possess a leg of copper that is commanded by Hecate herself. So my question, is it attached or is it just like a mannequin leg that they own and carry around? And if it shapeshifts, is it always a leg? Yeah, like if they become a cat, is it a cat leg? Or if they, I mean, I guess things have legs, but like a, a worm? Worms don't have legs. Snakes? They're all leg. It's also called bronze footed or daughter of Hecate. And she feasted on blood by transforming into a young woman and seducing men as they slept. Which, how can you seduce someone, second question, if they're already asleep? Um, you can't. That's non-consensual as fuck. <laughs> then there are the Lamia. Lamia? Lamia? Greek. I don't fucking know, man. They preyed on children in their beds. And then there were also Gello or Jello, you know? Sure. Like Jello with a G. And they were also female revenants or demons. But these ones, again, similar to Vitala, they were associated with miscarriages, infertility, and infant mortality. And then there are the Strigas or Strix, as they were incorporated into Roman mythology, not to be confused with like Striga in The Witcher. Wasn't that also in Supernatural? Yes. And it is like technically a, like a, an iteration of a vampire. Man, they got um, everything in Supernatural. Yeah. And they were said to be the bodies of crows or birds in general. And they were nocturnal, feeding on blood and flesh, which is kind of cool. But I'm sure that has the same root word as striga from Eastern European. Was that Polish, Czech folklore? Beats the hell out of me. I can't. What is The Witcher originally written in? Deep speech? I don't know. <laughs> we could do a quick goog. Do it. I'm doing it. Wow. That is a Polish name if I ever saw one. Polish, yeah. Oh my god, he's 75. Wow. <gasps> we have the same birthday. Oh, really? Whoa! Okay. Oh, I noticed this year that the solstice is not on your birthday. It's a leap year. Oh yeah, it never is on a leap year. Oh, speaking of leap years, I saw a TikTok yesterday that was like, was it a TikTok? It might have been a TikTok. I can't remember. But it just said 2020. Chiefs versus 49ers, Biden versus Trump, 2024. Chiefs versus 49ers, Biden versus Trump. And I was like, oh no. Was that the Super Bowl lineup of 2020? Yes. I remember that Super Bowl I was, party I went to. Did not pay attention. Last time I paid attention to the Super Bowl, I believe it was 2010. In Green Bay. Well, I did live in Kansas and it won wasn't the title. Kansas, so anyway, Striga. I can't help but notice that it seems to be women largely getting blamed for a lot of vampirism or things associated with vampirism i came across this wild article about the correlation between medusa and vampires and menstruation okay i'm ready and i don't know i don't know if i can do it justice here but we'll put the link in the show notes basically this historian and she calls herself a body historian and she's very obviously extremely feminist she talked about work from this other person that she was citing about abject horror which is horror caused by something that doesn't respect boundaries or rules or that threatens our understanding of reality or existing liminally so vampires exist in the liminal space between life and death right and menstrual blood she calls gendered blood marking a sexual divide and symbolically representing death because it's blood, as well as this feminine creative power. And then she connects this Victorian, sorry, she connects us to Victorian doctors who described women with hysteria as vampires who sucked the life of healthy people around them. Mm. Um, and like the whole idea is kind of complicated and requires further reading into, into this article. But the last paragraph, I'm just going to read it to kind of sum it up. Because 
it has a really interesting connection correlation kind of thing uh concept even um so she says if in vampire stories there is a fetishization fetish fetishization oh my god of menstrual blood there are also disordered bodies unnatural people who need to be controlled and contained vampires and older myths such as medusa can subvert patriarchal heteronormative order dracula is not a tale of female vampirism such as carmilla which we'll talk about later but of female vampirization by men in a project to control and contain the female body and its dangerous sexuality Bleeding women have long been viewed as both sacred and profane, divine and degraded, with menstrual myths being deeply embedded in misogyny. Still, menstruation signals the potential for life and creation, and it's significant that where gender is concerned, both vampires and Medusa combine sex drive and death drive, a warning against the dangers of female sexuality tinged with a hint of envy of the female creative power. Some of that I don't agree with, but I do think it's really interesting that it comes back to this like patriarchal idea and, and how all of these things started as like female propaganda i don't know <laughs> uh, well yeah um i feel like that has been a common trend right you know, um blaming the woman who's menstruating yeah yeah we'll come back to <laughs> feminism later don't you worry. must be sent to your menstruation hot I would love that. Does it have pillows and books and bevies and um, nap time? Literally all of the ibuprofen? Yes. I'm there. It could be a dirt floor. If there's ibuprofen, I'm there. (laughs) In Old Norse, Draugr come up a lot. Reference alongside early vampires. But Yes. But (laughs) these are definitely more like zombies, in my opinion. Yes, they're described as reanimated corpses. So um, I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about them more in the near future. Probably. In 16th century Jewish literature, there is an account of an old woman. Allegedly, she was uncharitable, a.k.a. a bitch, uh, whose body upon her death was left unguarded and unburied for three days. Also, it's a woman again. Uh, And it was believed that because of this. So I don't know anything about burial customs in judaism but apparently there's a ritual guarding of the deceased called a shmira yes this didn't happen with this mean old lady and so that gave an evil spirit the opportunity to possess her body i assume that the ritual guarding is to prevent such things happening then she was set to rise as a vampiric entity and kill hundreds of people did it say how she was stopped or if she was stopped no it did not <laughs> She just went off. Yep. Go off, girl. In the 17th and 18th century, that's when the idea of the vampire really took root in Eastern European cultures, um, societies, villages. I meant to say Eastern Europe, and then I just ran with it. (laughs) I knew what you meant. Thanks. This is what goes on to form the foundation of what we know as the vampire today. So one of the earliest recordings is from 1672 in modern Croatia, and it describes a panic among villagers when a man, who had actually died 16 years earlier, became a vampire and was now drinking blood and sexually harassing his widow. Eventually, they drove a stake through the heart of this guy's corpse and also cut off his head. Throwback to episode one, we love a good beheading. We do, we do. Okay, we're going to fast forward a century or so, but let's remember that the 18th century was the age of enlightenment. So while scientific explanations were explaining away a lot of supernatural beliefs, vampire panics were actually becoming more widespread. Irony. In the early to mid-1700s, there are tons of alleged vampire sightings throughout Eastern Europe, leading there to be a ton of exhumations of people they believe are responsible. Government officials were actually given jobs that meant they had to go out and hunt vampires and stake them. I don't know if anyone volunteered for that job or if it was just given to them, but... Government officials? That could be anybody. That could be a librarian. We could be government officials, technically. Uh, I'm not hunting no vampire, thank you. Uh, No, I'm just saying we could be. Oh, sure. We work for a university. (laughs) Yeah. So the first two cases recorded here <laughs> God. names again we love them i don't know 
if it's Peter or Petar or Petar or something, but it's Peter, but with E T A instead of E T E. E T A. I'm, I'm sure it's just him, Peter. I'm just gonna call him Peter. Petar. <laughs> Sorry, Petar. If anyone has named that, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Oh, God damn it. Blagovich. Blagojevich. Peter hmm. Blagojevich. Here we go. In Prussia. Oh my God. And Milo Cesar in Serbia. Milo. Milo. <laughs> In the case of Peter, it was reported that when he died, he was 62, and then he returned after his death to ask his son for food, and then the son said, no, dad, you're dead. Then his body was found the next day. Peter allegedly returned again and attacked some neighbors who died from blood loss. One, how does anyone know what happened with the son if he was dead? Yeah. Two, how reliable were people in the 1700s talking about blood loss? Not very. Three, what happened to Peter? Again, we don't know. (laughs) Was he staked by a government official? The second case, the one in Serbia, uh, Milo, he was a soldier who returned, nope, he retired to be a farmer. And he was said to have been attacked by vampires like back in the day. And then he died. People in the surrounding area started to die and everyone was like, oh, Milo's become a vampire. And is killing everyone. That gives the same energy as like, oh yeah, that old lady at the house at the end of the street. She's yeah. casting a curse on this neighborhood because she stays in her house all the time. It keeps the lights off. It's like, no, bitch. She just wants to be alone. Same. With my graveyard dirt that I'm going to bring back. <laughs> oh my gosh. So these two stories were so well known at the time that government officials were doing actual studies more government officials, and writing reports, which ultimately led to a panic known as the 18th century vampire controversy. It was a whole controversy. And then this lasted an entire generation of people. Can you imagine if the millennials wrote something like that? The Gen Zers would fucking destroy us. They already do. It's hard being on the cusp. It's hard. My life is hard. (laughs) I struggle every goddamn day. Who am I? Listen, that's a question I ask my therapist all the time. You're a millennial. That's who you are. Uh, That explains everything. (laughs) So, of course, this panic was higher in rural areas because there were fewer educated people. So, therefore, a greater belief in superstitions. So, a lot of these people, like we talked about last time, were going about um, digging up corpses like that guy in that episode of Expedition Unknown still Mm -hmm. happening today. Um, often you know their neighbors friends loved ones like could you dig up your family member and stake them that would be traumatic in itself this behavior ultimately ended when the empress of austria maria Theresa, was like this is getting silly and she sent her personal physician to investigate all the vampire reports And probably unsurprisingly, he came back and said vampires aren't real. So the Empress made it illegal to open graves and desecrate corpses. And so that kind of brought that vampire panic to an end. But one of the most popular cases of vampire panic is in New England. The New England vampire. The New England vampire panic. The. The New England vampire panic. The first victim of which was probably Rachel Burton in 1793 in Manchester, Vermont, who was exhumed after her death by her husband in an attempt to save his new wife, who died anyway. The level of petty it would take for me to die and then come back as a vampire and prey on the new wife is actually not that high for me. I would totally do that. Are you kidding me? Haunting. Is very much on your schedule after. It sure is. Although I wouldn't have a husband to haunt because everyone knows it's always been my lifelong dream to be a widow. Right. You'll just have to haunt his ghost, which is fascinating. I think that just means we haunt together. Yeah. So romantic. Yeah. Anyway, uh, spoiler alert for the New England Vampire Panic. It was all tuberculosis. (laughs) Oh, no, not TB again. (laughs) Or consumption, as it was called back in in those days. 
Uh, and it was super trendy to have TB, in case you didn't know. Lord Byron, who we'll talk more about later, he actually said out loud, I should like to die of consumption. <laughs> Good for him. Did he? I don't think so. I know he died really young. Mm. I don't. A lot of the romantic poets did die of consumption, like John Keats, but I don't remember if he was one of them. I don't know how Lord Byron died. I'll look that up for next episode because it'll still be on topic. And when asked why, he said, because all the ladies would look and say, look at the poor Byron, how interesting he looks in dying. He's doing it for the, for the, I don't know. He's doing it for Instagram at this point, I think. At at this point, I don't even know. What does one look like when one is dying of tuberculosis? Interestingly. Look at me. I'm skinny. Well, and this is the thing. Like, you know, TB Chic is one of my main aesthetic choices. And you don't actually have to contract TB to look like a Tim Burton character. Not that I'll ever be skinny enough to look like I have TB, but I'll make it work one way or another. Tuberculosis? TB? Tim Burton? Oh my god! <laughs> it's all coming together! <laughs> we cracked the mysteries of the universe. Yeah. I don't know if you could tell, but if you might have been able to see the formulas appearing over <laughs> oh my, my god. head as I, <laughs> as I was, the synapses were forming. It probably goes without saying that TB was most detrimental to the poor and the working classes, but the aesthetic was so desirable by the upper class with the pale skin and the rapid weight loss and the fever that seemed to brighten your eyes and rosy your cheeks. All qualities that were already considered desirable in women. And this is one of my most favorite fun facts, actually. TB heavily influenced the trends of that time. So The reason that those narrow corseted waists and the big skirts that further emphasize the narrow waists were popular is because of TB. And like, that's the style that we associate with, you know, the Victorian fashion is the corsets and the poofy skirts. And it's all because of TB. Well, think of now people have made masks trendy. Yeah. Or like heroin chic in the 90s. Sure. (laughs) I totally know what you're talking about. However, also another factor to this being one of my favorite fun facts, they started to think that the fashion was actually contributing to the spread of TB because the full skirts like dragging on the street outside, bringing germs into the house and the corsets restricting proper lung movement and circulation and even men's Facial hair trends it affected because they kind of thought the same thing about men's facial hair, like it trapped germs in the in their beards and their mustaches. And so they had to be clean shaven in order to not get sick. Obviously, germ theory didn't exist then, but they were they're trying their best. You know, the most famous victim of the New England vampire panic is that of Mercy Brown in Exeter, Rhode Island in 1883. The Brown family matriarch, Mary Eliza, died of. TB. Within a year, daughter Mary Olive was showing the same symptoms, and during the duration of her illness, she would speak about her nightmares and a crushing weight that drew the life out of her while she slept. She died in 1884, and then things seemed okay until five years later when the only son of the family, Edwin, started showing the same signs of his sister. So Edwin actually traveled to this newfangled health spa in Colorado Springs, which is now known as the Stanley Hotel. Yes. And originally established as some kind of recovery center for people suffering from TB. So he went out there with his wife and actually seemed to recover from the worst of his symptoms until 1891 when Mercy Lena Brown, known as Lena, also contracted consumption. She got a more rare form known as galloping consumption, which I think just has a more rapid decline. So she's buried in the winter of 1892 at Chestnut Hill Baptist Church Cemetery. And this news brings Edwin back from Colorado. And then he started to get sick again and stayed with his father-in-law. Originally, he claimed to have the same dreams as his sister. But this time he says he sees the specter of Lena beckoning to him. And this started rumors across town, which then really contributed to the panic. So at this point, the Brown family of five was now just Edwin and the father, George. And George was worried 
he would have to bury his only surviving child. So he did what any dad would do and had his wife and daughters exhumed to search for signs of unholy interference after caving to the pressure put him by the other people in Exeter. Oh, I love being a woman. (laughs) In case you need reminding of TB, the symptoms include high fever, profuse sweating, which leads to dehydration. Oh shit, I must have TB. Probably. (laughs) Chest pain, coughing with blood, Uh, insert a montage of like every scene from every movie, like Moulin Rouge. I just suddenly remembered Red Dead Redemption 2 and Arthur Morgan. Oh! Oh! Uh-huh. He, he died of TB in that game. What a bitch. <gasps> oh, I don't know anything I'm about so that deeply game. <laughs> oh my god. It's the greatest. He's the greatest man. Don't even talk to me right now. Okay. End of podcast. TV. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Coughing up blood. Uh-huh. Yeah. Rapid weight loss, which is why it was called consumption, because the body looks like it's being consumed from the inside out. And thickening of humors and sinking in the eyes. The humors. The humors. Lip nodes. Do you know what the four humors are? Pop quiz. No. No. Wait. Uh, Is blood one of them? Yes. Phlegm? Yes. That's all I got. I don't know. Okay, blood, which supposedly uh, was made up of the other three humors and was the energy source for both the body and soul. Phlegm, but not how we think of phlegm today. Phlegm is any white or colorless body fluid. So like sweat and saliva were phlegm, but also like pus and mucus. And? Jizz, yes. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, thank you. Black bile, which came from the spleen, and an excess of which would cause depression and cancer, theoretically. I should have known that one. And then, no, you should know yellow bile, which is believed to be the fluid found in the gallbladder, but also in vomit and poo. Ah. So if you had an excess of this humor, it would make you angry and irrational. Wow, I'm really reining it in then. Fuck. (laughs) Well, well... Do I have an excess though? Well, not I don't anymore, have a but <laughs> Thinking yeah. about where we were in 2021, it totally makes sense. I'm trying to think of how angry <laughs> I used to be. That's about the same. I've calmed down in my old age, mm-hmm. but also gotten Your old so age, much yeah. more violently angry. It's because when you, you get know? mad, you get really mad. You know, you're not just like mad yeah. all the time anymore. I feel I feel I've evolved this way as well. The stuff that used to make me mad doesn't really make me mad anymore, but the stuff that really makes me mad really 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 fuck it makes me mad uh when i was a child this is gonna be this might be a little telling of whatever mental illness i need to be diagnosed with uh but i used to get my most frequent frustration or like bouts of rage would be when other people didn't understand what i was trying Mm -hmm. to explain um and i would get so like internally angry that i could not express what i needed to for them and i would also be mad that they wouldn't like instantly get it like I could. It's really good you don't have that problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, because that happens a lot. I don't make any fucking sense. <laughs> Are you kidding? But now most of what I get frustrated with or like full of rage about is, how do I describe this? See, this is, <laughs> this is another problem. It's, it's when I'm um, not taken seriously. So I guess it kind of stems from that. Yeah. But- it's it used to be like not being understood and now it's more like not being taken seriously. Um incompetent people just piss me off, but everyone knows that. <laughs> I know. And everyone but you is incompetent, so you're just not mad at everybody all the but time. Pretty much. <laughs> well <laughs> anyway, so that's all ancient Greek medical beliefs. Um my but God. there was so little known about anatomy and physiology for such a long time that that was the foundation of a lot of medicine into the 19th century. And like they were kind of kind of there with the blood. That's why bloodletting is a thing because they were trying to bring balance to that humor. Right. You know, bloodletting works, but not for the reasons that they thought it did. Should should I tell my bloodletting story? Ew, have I yeah. told you this? No, tell me. I swear to God, I had. Maybe um, you have, and I just don't remember. I believe I told you when we went on the Cleveland road trip, uh, because we drove 
oh. past this um this town where there is a reenactment village called uh Hale Farm, I believe, in Northeast Ohio. And as a young child of seven or eight or whatever the hell age I was, uh, we went sort of in in rounds to the different buildings where we learned about things like how doctors handled patients in the early 1800s of a uh, white settlement in Northeast Ohio and things like uh, beeswax candle making, because that was really popular um, in, you know, Medina, Ohio, they have that huge candle business mm-hmm. made of beeswax. Anyway, um, all kinds of shit like that. Baking bread, you name it. They got everything. Well, we went into the doctor's house, which was a genuine historic building where the doctor used to live. Um, and this man brought out this little toolkit full of li- sharpened knives and such, little scissors and like a one of those big steel pans. Mm-hmm. He was like, all right, I'm going to need a volunteer. Well, you know me. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. Let's learn about history. <laughs> Cut me open, bitch. <laughs> Had me sit on a little stool In comes the knife closer and closer to my arm. I thought he was really going to cut me up. So I like yanked my arm out of his grip and I was crying and screaming and like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to get, I don't want to bleed. And eventually he got pretty pissed at me. He's like, I'm not actually going to cut you. That was that. Oh, a grown man getting pissed at a small child because he didn't explain himself properly. Great. It was also entirely possible. I wasn't paying full attention. Yeah. But he could have explained it better i'm sure yeah you know been more reassuring consent a little more than i need a volunteer yeah that's why i don't volunteer for things not like that anyway think about bloodletting a lot and i feel like i was aware of do you think about bloodletting more than the roman empire (laughs) absolutely back to mercy brown lena the local physician is who performed the exhumations of the women. George and Edwin did not attend, and the physician noted that both Mary and Mary Olive showed the expected levels of decomposition. However, reports of his reactions to Lena's body are mixed. Some say he was unsurprised by its condition, and others say he was baffled at its apparent lack of decomposition. It's winter in new england so i would assume there wouldn't be that much decomp because it's fucking cold out you know Ground's frozen no bugs no sun well not no sun but you know what i mean so any observations made by the physician were largely ignored by the villagers who removed her heart and liver cremated them and then made them into some some kind of concoction to cure edwin you know, her brother. And I don't know if he consumed it or not, but he died less than two months later either way. Damn. And then George was offered sympathies for the necessary violation of his youngest daughter, which that use of wording kind of reminded me of that article I read about like the gendered blood and all that. Like, it's always women. This account supposedly inspired the character of Lucy in Dracula, as well as one of H.P. Lovecraft's earlier stories called The Shunned House. It's not a very good one. And you can still visit the headstone of Mercy Brown today if you're in Rhode Island. Other diseases have been suggested as being possible sources of vampire folklore. One of those is porphyria, which is a rare blood disorder for the record and like some people argue that it can make you sensitive to garlic and light and blah 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 anyway it's a really i don't want to say weird because like the people who have porphyria aren't weird but like porphyria itself is weird if that makes sense sure i don't want to stigmatize it concept Um, of porphyria yes yeah there's diseases that do all kinds of shit the especially the like blood disorder so is there always like the weirdest ones medically i think oh i think like autoimmune disorders are just fucking well whack. yeah that's like true. they really yeah, yeah, wreck yeah, yeah. you that's true mental health disorders <laughs> well yeah obviously <laughs> listen okay 
The earliest mention of this Porphyria theory comes in 19, the 1960s. It's highly disputed. The theory gained the most traction when a biochemist, I can't wait to tell you his name. I'm excited. David Dolphin. <laughs> Dr. David Dolphin. <laughs> Fucking triple D. I think the paper got more popular because it was written by a dolphin in a lab. Sure. <laughs> Dr. Dolphin. <laughs> like at a conference, you know? How dolphin, dolphin. Can I hang up? <laughs> Is that a thing that's fine? Can I hang up? <laughs> he wrote this paper about the connection between porphyria and vampires and also werewolves for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Though it has been rejected by several folklorists as well as re- researchers who think that it's creating a stigma around people with porphyria. And they argue that one, porphyria is too rare to explain multiple sudden deaths. Wow. Something happened there. I think we need to address it. That was very British. You. It sure was. I love it so much. I don't. I didn't even register what you actually said. I only registered that. So you're gonna have to repeat yourself. Porphyria is too rare to explain multiple sudden deaths that would appear in family units or villages. Right. Number two, people with porphyria don't actually crave blood, which is like one of the kind of stereotypes. Um, and the hematin enzyme that alleviates a lot of symptoms can't be absorbed via ingestion, so drinking blood would not actually provide any relief. And there are a few other reasons that like folkloric vampires were never sensitive to sunlight as we think of them. Um, but like those first two things are the the main two points against it, which like, yeah, if it's a rare blood disease and like entire villages are just dropping dead, that seems a little unlikely. Mm-hmm. Fun fact, especially for the Bridgerton slash Queen Charlotte girlies, some people argue that George III's madness was cor- uh, fucking hell was caused by porphyria. And although this is another hotly debated area, several of his descendants are also suspected to have had it. And his great 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 grandson, who would have been a cousin of Queen Elizabeth was actually diagnosed with it. So there is some potential for porphyria in the royal family bloodline. Some people also think that George III's ancestor, Mary, Queen of Scots, inherited it from her father, James V of Scotland. So it reminds me of that werewolf episode of Doctor Who. (laughs) Just saying. Um, Another disease accused of causing vampire panic. Do you have any guesses? Let me see. A disease? Yes. Causing vampire panic. A much more common one. Schizophrenia. No. It's not a mental health disorder. (laughs) Damn. Uh, Influenza. Mm, No. Rabies. Oh, I like that better. That's way more interesting. Here's a quote from an At Geo article that I will also link to, obviously. It's quoting a book called Vampire Forensics by Mark Jenkins, which... It's not a book that I've read, but it's existed on my wish list for like three years now. And I, I've never come across it at a used bookstore, so I don't own it. Man, <laughs> libraries, bro. You can get it on your phone now. Yeah, but I don't even read the books that I have. I also have a whole book about, oh, I think I got it. No, I got it when I was in Kentucky. It's about the science of poison in Agatha Christie novels and how she essentially created this like whole shot. I'm really excited to read it. I'll do it one day just so we can talk about it. Spanish neurologist Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso made a correlation between reports of rabies outbreaks in and around the Balkans, especially a devastating one in dogs, wolves, and other animals that played hungry from 1721 to 1728 and the vampire epidemics that erupted shortly thereafter correlates with what i said earlier wolves and bats if rabid had the same snarling slobbering look about them that folklore ascribed to vampires as would a human being suffering from rabies various other symptoms support the rabies vampire link dr gomez alonzo found that nearly 25 percent of rabid men have a tendency to bite other people 
this almost guarantees transmission as the virus is carried in saliva. Rabies can even help explain the supposed aversion of vampires to garlic because infected people display a hypersensitive response to any pronounced olfactory stimulation, which would naturally include the pugnant smell of garlic. End quote. Pugnant? Pungent. Whatever. <laughs> I know you were reading. Um, <laughs> I was say- wow. Pun- P- pugnant? Like repugnant? Close enough. A dumbass. Okay. Um, <laughs> holy shit. He also said that as well as strong smells um strong visual stimuli like bright light can cause spasms in the face and the vocal muscles which can produce groans and bare teeth and like frothing at the mouth and you know that aspect of things that might also be attributed with vampires isn't that wild that's insane it's a lot of fun it makes the most sense i mean tv makes the most sense but like if you want to get well, none of it makes any sense, but yeah. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Okay. If you suspended belief enough, which makes the most sense? If you were into conspiracy theories, it's which would not make even the most that. Sense? It's like the that whole like science is magic kind of thing, you know? Sure. It's like, oh well, here's science that people didn't understand at the time, and they just used this crazy folklore story to explain it away which was dangerous but i still think that tb makes the most sense given how contagious tb is and um i didn't talk about it in these notes but i think i also read somewhere that cholera was another popular one that was um often attributed alongside vampire panics as well Anyway, so speaking of medical things, I want to talk about a historical figure that comes up a lot when talking about real-life vampires, Elizabeth Bathory, Yay. who has a reputation for bathing in the blood of virgins to maintain her youth and beauty, among other things. Again, a woman, demonized. But hey, at least she's young and hot. I... Okay, Elizabeth was born in 1560 to a powerful family in the area where present-day Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania come together, which is also the region where Transylvania is, I think. Slovakia? Yeah. Where Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania come together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was promised to Count Ferenc Nadashti from another powerful Hungarian family when she was 11 or 12 because their marriage would secure more power for both families. And during her betrothal to Nadashti, or McNasty, as I like to call him, she became pregnant at 13 with the child of a common-born man. Ew. So Ferenz, turns out, was a real Ramsey Bolton because he ordered this commoner to be castrated and literally ripped apart by a pack of dogs. Cool. Apparently, this was standard practice at the time, so... I guess that's where George R.R. Martin got it from. But regardless of whether or not the guy was actually jealous, it was just the thing that was done. Uh, the baby was given away to be raised elsewhere to avoid the scandal and rumor and all that. Backtrack real quick. Uh huh. What season did that happen? Oh, God. I think I don't think it was George R.R. R. Martin then. I'm going to say five. Five? Okay. So, yeah, seasons one through five was yeah. uh, from the books. Consulting the Goog. Because I don't remember reading that in the books but oh he died in season six so it was probably season six yeah all right well whatever anyway but i read through those books so quickly i lord of the dread fort Ooh. listen i know you think i'm weird but i fucking love house Bolton. that's fine you can be wrong (sighs) that uh, that's possible elizabeth marries friends account thus becoming a countess And though she was known as Lady Nandashti around the estate, she kept Bathory as her official, in Hungarian, her name is like Elizabeth Bathory or something like that, but it's been anglicized as Elizabeth Bathory, obviously. Anyway, she kept that as her official name. And Ferenc actually took her name in marriage because she held a higher social station than he did. Despite that, he was still rich and powerful enough to give her a whole castle and 17 accompanying villages as a wedding gift. Wow. Right? It, the castle was Castle Shakti, which was gifted to friends by his mother, actually. Shakti of the Jedi? <laughs> I would take any castle in Scotland as a wedding gift, just in case anyone's sure. curious. 
I'll get right on that. Okay. <laughs> I do have some fun facts about their wedding. Uh, I have a lot of fun facts today. 4,500 people were invited. Nope, were in attendance. Prior to the ceremony, friends participated in a tournament and was put to a ritual test where Elizabeth and all of her attendants or bridesmaids wore veils and paraded around him and he had to correctly pick out which one was Elizabeth. And he succeeded and then he got to kiss her. That was a surprise. And then there was some feasting and drinking and a couple were led to their chamber by a bunch of dudes with torches and they um, did that thing that happened back then where they like made sure the marriage was consummated. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to sit and watch. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. Yeah. It was so common. Like, I get it, but no thanks. So during their marriage, Ferenc was gone a lot, often at war, fighting the Ottoman Empire. I like to think that he fought fought against Nandor the Relentless, personally. (laughs) Sure, I hope so. He he was kind of a himbo, apparently. He had the reputation of being a brutal and violent warlord, though, and he was known as the Black Knight of Hungary. But, you know, like hot but dumb still. Mm -hmm. But his health would begin to decline in 1601, and he would eventually succumb to paralysis and finally death in 1604 at the age of 48. And before dying, he entrusted his heirs and widow. I think they'd been married for almost 30 years at this point. And he entrusted Elizabeth and their children to the care of, listen, it's spelled Georgi, but I think it's pronounced (laughs) Yurge. Jörg Thorzo, the Palatine of Hungary, which is the highest ranking office beneath the king. And um, he also happened to be Elizabeth's cousin. And we'll come back to him in a minute. So Elizabeth would spend most of her time in her castle overseeing the estates and performing other duties of nobility. Their estate didn't have a male doctor or barber surgeon kind of guy. So she would have to arrange healers to oversee medicine, which... Knowing what's going to happen, it sounds a lot like fuel to accuse someone of witchcraft, in my opinion. Yeah, there's a a trend. Yeah. She was also highly educated and very intelligent. She could read and write in Hungarian, German, Greek, Latin, and a little bit of Slovak. And she spent a lot of time advocating on the behalf of the destitute, abused, or assaulted women, which does seem contradictory to all these accounts we're going to get into of alleged torture of women and girls in baths full of their blood, accounts of which most seem to be set after Ferenc's health starts to decline and then ramped up in the time after his death. And it's said that her first victims were peasant girls between the ages of 10 and 14 who were lured to the estate with promises of training and education in the castle as servants and maids or girls who were already under her employment as such. And it's also said that she would then move on to hire born girls who were sent to learn etiquette and, like, courtly behaviors from her. Alleged witnesses and survivors, alleged, would later come forward with claims of cruelties such as follows. (laughs) Fatal beatings with club. One story says that she beat someone and was splashed with their blood and noticed that it touched her where her skin was left with this rosy, luminous appearance, which... It is what f- kind of feeds that story about her bathing or drinking the blood of virgins to maintain her beauty. Uh, mutilation of the hands, including driving needles into the fingertips. I'm going to ignore you said that. The needles were allegedly left like this. Quickly move on. And Quickly any- move on. <laughs> anyone who attempted to remove them would have their entire fingernail ripped up. Burning flesh with red hot irons, including genitals, as in red hot pokers being inserted into the vagina also ironing the soles of their feet starvation including by means of sewing their lips together or sewing their tongue to their lips oh god ice baths or leaving the victims tied naked in the snow um it couldn't involve drenching them in water and leaving them outside or submerged in up to their necks in a vat of water and leaving them outside to freeze Covering the victims in honey and then introducing ants or other insects or leaving them outside for wild animals to be attracted to them. Stabbing or cutting with scissors, which allegedly was her favorite, according to one source. And by cutting, I mean like lips, earlobes, tip of the nose, eyelids, like anything that you could easily snip off with scissors. Also castration, 
stabbing the breasts, arms, hands, face, and lips, or biting hard enough to remove chunks of flesh, and whippings with stinging nettles or making servants sit on the nettles naked. I think a uh, belated trigger warning <laughs> if you don't want to hear about stabbing, <laughs> castration, or sharp things in places where you don't want them. Mostly your fingernails. Mostly your yeah. fingernails and around your eyelids and such. Good fucking God. Historical accounts of medical treatments at that time suggest that multiple forms of torture listed there may have actually been attempts to heal sick people, like I said, kind of hinted at earlier, like, and then exaggerated these accusations supposedly reached the ears of her cousin, uh, Yurch, mm. <laughs> the Palatine. In 1610, so Yerge, under the orders of King Matthias II, conducts a kind of raid on the castle in search of evidence of alleged crimes and to apprehend Elizabeth for a trial. And he wrote in a letter to his wife that upon his arrival, he found her in the middle of torturing three girls, but there's no evidence to support that. And over the next year, 300 witness testimonies would be taken And any of those that came forward with complaints and accusations were relatives of the alleged victims. One woman who worked in the castle claimed that she had written a detailed ledger of 650 murders. But this, suspiciously, was never accounted for. And also this woman turned out to be illiterate, by the way. (laughs) Like, try harder with your lies. Come on. (laughs) Most sources who comment on this testimony have suggested that there are actually no first-hand account i did it again no first-hand accounts of seeing actual torture and murder the more likely number of deaths technically attributed to elizabeth is more realistically around to be 50 and we don't even know if those would actually be considered murder you know like again maybe she was trying to heal some of the girls who are sick or whatever And maybe some of them just died from natural causes. It's the fucking 1600s, you know? Everybody's dying of something. 50 is still a lot of deaths anyway. Yeah. But that's over a course of... a little... That's over a course of, what, like 40 years? True. Elizabeth's lands and estates were stripped from her and divided amongst her family to avoid seizure by the crown. Four servants of her were tortured until they confessed crimes that may have not even been committed. Sure. Because... Those are always really re- uh, reliable, you know? Yeah, forced confessions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two of her servants had their fingers torn from their hands with red hot pincers, sorry, and then were burned alive. <laughs> the third was treated with leniency and given a lifetime prison sentence, as she appeared to be a victim of torture herself. The last servant was believed to be coerced by the noblewoman and was beheaded as a more merciful punishment, and then his body was burned. And a fifth servant... Blah, 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 fifth servant was said to have eluded capture initially only to later be caught and bird alive burned alive bird alive <laughs> which bird seems, alive. seems sus sus <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> fuck yeah there's no first-hand accounts no written documents no first-hand testimony whatever so it's believed that nearly Everything was rumor or speculation while the trial was underway. Within a week, the king decided that she was guilty and wanted her to be executed. But old, old, old Yorch, Yorge, Yorgi, Georg, suggested perhaps a nunnery. And the king was like, no, that's stupid. And so they take thee to a nunnery. (laughs) So they compromised with house arrest. Um, There are two (laughs) versions of this, though. The more boring one is that she was kept inside the walls and allowed to roam freely. And the more depressing version is that she was bricked into a room with slats so that supplies could be exchanged, like food and stuff. Both maybe are probably partially true. Second one is just the CW version. (laughs) But it's thought that she was in lockdown for about four years until she was discovered dead at the age of 54. Again, like that whole thing about why is it always women, you know? Turns out uh, a lot of people probably had ulterior motives for investigating and prosecuting Elizabeth and her servants. A lot of sources seem to corroborate that the stories of her blood bathing didn't arise until about 115 years later. Ooh. Biblical level accuracy here. Yeah, some extreme posthumous uh, yeah. investigating. 
and it was presumed to slander her or her family. And it's worth emphasizing the fact that, that this was an extremely powerful and wealthy woman for 16th century Europe. And recent scholars are beginning to now more than ever question the validity of this story. Number one, our list of things to consider. Ferenc had been loaning a lot of money to the crown in support of the war against the Ottoman Empire. And after he died, Elizabeth wasn't shy about reminding the king that he still had to pay her back. And he did not like that, especially coming from a woman. But he also knew that if he could convict Elizabeth with a capital crime, he could eliminate his debt and take all of her land and property. So after her arrest, the king's debt was eliminated by the Bathory family on the condition that they get to be in control of her confinement. And um, like I said, he didn't get her land because the family like divvied it up amongst themselves before it could be seized. I mean, no one really knows where they stand on this matter, but that was probably just them trying to keep their shit in their family, you know. And she had actually written a will dictating how it should be split up prior to her arrest as well. So Um, also religion, number two, it was the early 1600s in the Bathory family were Protestant. The king was Catholic. It's only been a few years at this point since Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament being a Catholic and King James being a Protestant inside the Houses of Parliament at that time. Uh, Religious persecution was at its prime here, so that may have just added fuel to the fire for the king to want to get rid of like that family's wealth. Number three, a common one we see um, in colonial America, widows were often used as scapegoats. They were easy targets. And like a lot of Elizabeth's circle, they were frequently a few ac- accused of witchcraft <laughs> and witches would soon become a hot topic, obviously, across Europe and here in the colonies. Then, finally, there's the fact that despite all the reported accounts, no one actually seems to have witnessed anything directly, nor is there any record of such a high number of girls going missing whatsoever at that time. Like, peasant girls were technically property of the crown, so also on top of that, a castle, like an estate the size of Shaktis, would need a lot of servants to keep it running efficiently and smoothly, So it seems unlikely that a noble woman as intelligent as Elizabeth would have jeopardized her pool of employees that way. Also, another fun fact, combine all of that stuff with the logistics of taking frequent blood baths. Are you ready for some numbers? Yeah, I'm ready. An average bath uses 30 gallons of water, which is 240 pints. And the average adult woman has nine to ten pints of blood in their body. But she didn't bathe in the blood of adults. She liked the young girls. So let's say eight pints of blood. One bath would require 30 girls worth of blood. Gross. That's also assuming that you drain every last drop, which is unlikely. And that's not taking into account that blood will coagulate after an hour if it's not constantly being moved so she lit a fire under the bath she just rocked back and forth the whole time you know yeah <laughs> she had uh like a kitchen aid mixer going yeah yeah in one corner yeah jacuzzi she had the jacuzzi jets yeah it was for sure another theory besides the politics kind of going back to our medical theories is that she was stricken with seizures in her younger years presumably caused by a form of epilepsy at the time referred to as falling sickness and at the time one of the treatments of epilepsy was to have the blood of a healthy un- unaffected donor rubbed on your lips or ingesting a piece of healthy donor's skull as the seizure ended uh, i was very unexpected <laughs> Like, who thought of that and why? Listen, man. No one knows if that's true or not, but it's one of those things that could have been true and then was also sensationalized as part of the slander. My opinion at the end of the day is that she was probably a badass woman who just got fucked by the patriarchy. Word. Mic drop. (laughs) All the stuff I said about her, you know, like sticking up for the abused women and the, you know, like, Mm -hmm. mm. So her legend has been partially credited with inspiring Bram Stoker to write Dracula, although 
this claim is contested. The parallels are easy enough to draw. And who is the other most famous historical figure associated with uh, Dracula? Vlad. Hell yeah. <laughs> Vlad the Impaler, also known as Vlad Tepish, Vlad the Third, or Vlad Dracula. Isn't it Prince Vlad? Isn't it Prince um, or yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, he yeah, started yeah. as a prince. He was, or, I mean, he's Vlad the Third, so. Because yeah. in the story, he's not Count Dracula, he's Prince of Dracula. He's a count in the story. He is? Yeah. I, was mm-hmm. I think I'm just remembering incorrectly. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm sorry. <laughs> Vlad was a prince at first and then was a king, Vlad the Third. So, yes, he's said to be another inspiration for Count Dracula himself. However, there's pretty much no evidence for this. Bram Stoker's notes and working documents contain nothing about any Vlad whatsoever. And the name of the vampire was actually supposed to be Count Wampir. Literally, Count Vampire. Oh. Uh, Really? Like with a W? Yes. W N O Y. Mm -hmm. Awesome. In terms of Vlad Dracula, it's kind of like a a son of name, like Erickson, son of Eric. Vlad Dracula, son of Vlad Dracul. And Dracul was a surname that Vlad II basically adopted after he was knighted in the order of the dragon so he changed his name to be vlad the dragon which i'm kind of obsessed with okay bet i'm gonna name myself hannah the why was the first thing i thought of panda (laughs) hannah the panda the fuck do they even do man eat and sleep all day yes this is on brand (laughs) But yeah, so it's believed that Stoker just saw Vlad Dracula in a history book or something and thought it sounded cool and lifted it for his character. I don't know what I would be. JK, I'd be a crow. Uh, yeah. Georgia the raven? Georgia the lizard? <laughs> absolutely not. Lizards what? bask in the sun and we do not bask not in the sun. Not all lizard. Oh, I'm thinking of uh, salamanders. Or just the salamanders. Salamanders are pretty cute. They're so moist. <laughs> I'm not moist. I'm dehydrated as You're fuck. So dehydrated. You're oh. dry as fuck. <laughs> okay, I have another fun fact. Dracula holds the Guinness World Record for being the most played character in TV's uh, TV TV's and movie. <laughs> movies on tv and that's just dracula himself like not even vampires in general Mm -hmm. um we know there's a butt ton of those too looking at you vampire diaries twilight the show sucks vampire diaries yeah i've seen a lot of it popping up on my tiktok lately and i don't know why because i it's fucking bad i think i watched the first season and i was like okay that was stupid yeah and that was about it. That's also like around the time. That's when I lived in Greensburg and I lived alone and I didn't really do anything. And I watched that season. I also watched, oh, what the, oh like Once Upon a Time when that started coming oh, out. Oh my God. I recently started rewatching that. That show is terrible. But I love it so much. Also when I found Josh Gates for the first time. Oh yeah. On Destination Truth. Anyway, I think same as like Jekyll and Hyde and Frankenstein and probably others. So many people haven't read the source material, but they still know the story of these characters, you know? But, like, we talked about last week, Dracula was not the first vampire novel written. No, certainly not. So I have a book called The Penguin Book of Vampire Stories. It's an anthology of uh, vampire stories, obviously. I highly recommend it if you want to ease your way into some, like, goth vampire literature without diving straight into dracula oh i still think that you should dive right into vikram and the vampire (laughs) this book also has some like futuristic sci-fi vampire stories as well which is kind of cool and they were still written in like the 30s so it was like really weird for the time but uh this book i do own so if we ever start a book club podcast related book club but it's my first pick (laughs) And I think I got a secondhand copy for like less than ten dollars. So everybody go buy oh, it. Hell yeah. So as early as eighteen hundred, a vampire story was published in England, translated from German, and it's called Wake Not the Dead. This story relied on 
that Eastern European folklore as a source material, and it featured a female vampire. And then in 1816, that's when the year without a summer happened, which we talked about last time and we'll talk about more in my my next episode. Mm -hmm. For today, you just need to know that Lord Byron, whose actual name, (laughs) another fun fact, was George Gordon. That's stupid. (laughs) Fucking lame. I like Dr. Dolphin. He's way cooler. Uh, they were traveling to Switzerland to meet Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley. There was some bad weather, and to pass the time, Byron essentially challenged everyone to write their own ghost story, and Mary Shelley created Frankenstein. Percy Shelley seemed to write nothing because he got bored. That's me. And Lord Byron wrote a fragment of the story, and Mary Shelley was later quoted as writing that poor Paula Dory had a terrible idea about a school-headed lady. <laughs> I love it. Poor Polidori, for the record, was the youngest man ever granted a medical degree by the University of Edinburgh. Sweet. He died when he was 26, if that tells you anything. I mean, poor <laughs> Polidori, he died when he was 26. All the people on this trip died really young. I'm 26. We'll talk more about that next year. Okay. Next year. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? My next episode. That's next year. We're doing well. Uh, listen, I'm going to be 36 this year. My memory. I have the memory of an old person. Eh. And you know, I'm 57 years old. Damn! That's you and me every time. I know. You know, I'm going to be 36. Holy shit! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Following that summer, uh, a few years later, 1819 was when Polidori published The Vampire, which I did talk about last time. Uh, his antagonist was Lord Ruthven, who was quite similar to Lord Byron himself. And the story was based on or inspired by the fragment that Byron wrote for this uh, activity. But it's around this time with this story that that idea of the vampire that we have, like the seductive, sexual, aristocrat, that's when that idea was like, firmly implanted i think this is when we see that switch from the female vampire to the sexy male vampire why are the female vampires like demonic and the male vampires are sexy crazy isn't it like the female vampires are still sexy but it's always like that's a bad thing yeah but when the male vampires are sexy it's because they're like misunderstood and it's like fantastical and wonderful but the but the female vampires they're out to get you yeah yeah isn't that fucking infuriating anyway a little bit later 1845 that's when varney the vampire was published which i also mentioned last week um and that was a penny dreadful type of format and it ended up being 109 parts and it was so popular that they reprinted it in 1853 which i think is pretty cool six years before on the origin of species was published by charles darwin and probably more popular too <laughs> probably at the time at the time yeah. yeah i will argue that one of the most vampire one of the most vampire stories one of the most vampire stories of all time <laughs> is the one where they count <sighs> um and it's a hand up a puppet's ass <laughs> uh, uh, uh. that's the most iconic the most vampire of the vampires sure is I had to mention it. God, I just love that. Ugh, so many layers to, to humor. I just love that he's the count, and he counts. That he's yeah. the count. I know it. That I like. They count. I know. They're obsessed with it. <laughs> love it. One of the most famous vampire stories outside of Dracula is Carmilla, which I mentioned earlier, by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu, who, like Bram Stoker, was Irish. I guess Irish people are just good at vampire stories. Carmilla is about a sexy, seductive female vampire who's not interested in men. No, no. She likes to befriend young ladies and come and stay in their fancy estate homes with them and then have sleepovers where she turns into a cat and drinks their blood. Your cat would do that. Some real sapphic undertones there. Oh, um, yeah. Which were very, you know, not a thing at the time. Well, at least... In popular literature which this was in 1896 another lady vampire surfaces this is the good lady duquesne by mary elizabeth braddon um so we have a female author writing a female vampire 
this one kind of sucks though like the story doesn't suck but the vampire sucks she's an old lady who takes on a female traveling companion and then the, they just wither away so it's like more of a metaphorical sucking of like life energy than a literal sucking of blood it gives me um that story gives me like energy vampire vibes actually like yeah um, colin robinson yes big time and then the next year was when Dracula was published in 1897 after Bram Stoker took an interest in those European myths and folktales we discussed. That's the history of vampires. Really? Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? There's so much. A couple other stories I wanted to mention from that anthology. One is called Chamblo, and it's about a lady vampire in the future on Mars. And there's another one called The Werewolf and the Vampire, and they fall in love, and it's such a happy ending is it gay no damn it (laughs) and the other is called the living dead which is by robert block author of psycho also he wrote the script for the episode of star trek with the giant cat really (laughs) yes oh god that one is about an actor portraying a vampire in a film during world war ii i think it's set in france during the occupation And he uses his role as an opportunity to spy for the Nazis. But he does such a good job of pretending to be a vampire that the superstitious villagers stake him. Wow. It's so fucking funny. They were so ready for that. They're like, you know what? Yeah. Wow. I learned so much. Like there's- There was so much information. Still more I could have talked about, but I was like, I have to stop at some point. There are two things that I really wanted to talk about. They're both set in New Orleans, though. And I was thinking it would be fun to talk about them while we were in New Orleans, just for like... Does it have to do with the Ruger Room? Nope. Oh, oh, shit. Well, that concludes this week's broadcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you wish to stay in touch, reach out to us at broadcastfromthebelfry at gmail.com or stalk us on Instagram at broadcastfromthebelfry. Again, I hope you've enjoyed our little show. Please rate and review. And until next week, stay 